Sometimes I'm quite embarrassed to show you guys what I'm actually working on because it'll often be some tiny little chunk of, of a massive dream. But there's nothing tiny about the Imperial Palace on Terra, and my board is starting to look suitably epic. But today, after like 10 videos on this project, we're finally gonna see what makes this board so damn special. In the last video, we saw some absolutely mental progress, tripling the full size of the board. We doubled the width of the trench and the undercity, and finally built our ruined city sector, the centerpiece of the combat before the walls. And then just because you've all been so well behaved, I gave you a little sneak peek of the first fully painted section of the Imperial Palace. Now, not only am I gonna take you through the full painting journey that made the board look like this, we're also gonna build another massive section of palace walls which is finally going to give us a glimpse of the modular power of this massive layout. Because this board needs to represent the entire Imperial Palace, which is a bit of a tall order. <laughs> now today's video is going to be a bit of a wild ride, and this project is going to unfold in quite a strange way, which I'll explain as we crack on. But for now, we need to get our city tiles ready for painting. Now you guys might remember that a lot of these road tiles are custom shapes that I sliced up from the Games Workshop tiles, so I needed to join these together properly and make sure they were all the perfect size and then seal and clean up all the joins and edges. Nothing that a heap of Vallejo plastic putty can't fix. Then I rummaged through all the remaining sprues of the ruined city pieces and found a whole bunch of glorious little rubble piles and small details which I glued down into all of my removable ruined city buildings to begin creating some depth in the rubble profile and already this city is starting to look good. The massive foam structures of the expanded trench also needed some love with a bit of filler to grout and fill any dodgy gaps, especially with so many interesting foam shapes joining at strange angles. And then with that looking much more polished, I grabbed the remaining sprues of my industrial kits and got a bit inspired to create some really interesting details for the city that would help break up the kind of monotony of the repeating forms of a million doors and windows. First, I gathered up all the little mini shipping crates, which are just incredibly adorable and come in both intact and ruined versions. And then I got a bit more fancy, grabbing some of the silo pieces, which I have been using to make up void shield generators, but in the ruined city, the few outer localized voids that were deployed are long since blown out, so it is blowtorch time. Now what you're seeing here is about day five of a 10 day block of solid crafting, where I basically barely slept to try and get this first portion of the board finished and ready for a photo shoot for Warhammer Community. Unfortunately, a bunch of other projects went over schedule in the past months and my silly dad brain buried under the lack of sleep from my new newborn mixed up the submission date. So I suddenly found myself with like two weeks less to be ready for the photo shoot than I thought. So I started making things in a bit of a strange order. Like for instance, this foam wall here is the first half of the next trench, which will be a mirror of the first trench with more gangways joining the ruined city sector, and then what will become our second gatehouse and upper wall, which we will see a bit later on in this video. But for now, I just made the first half because it was perfect for hiding the trestle tables for the photo shoot. And then I decided that a half pillar, which would become the beginning of our second bridge, would go on the surface of the wall. And that simple addition of a kind of column shape jutting out to break up that big flat sheet of foam just added so much to this side of the city. As you guys know, my wife and I have just had our third baby and it's been quite a wild time here at Zorbazorb HQ and working out what to make for dinner amongst the chaos of life is just a mega hassle. So we turned to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals, including 20 minute recipes designed to minimize stress and maximize the time spent savoring your supper. And now when you try HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, you'll get free dessert for life. So you can satisfy your sweet tooth with one free dessert item per box while your subscription is active. Make delicious food a priority with quick, convenient recipes delivered right to you. Just choose your recipes and pick a delivery date. HelloFresh handles the meal planning and the shopping, so all you have to do is open your box of pre-portioned ingredients and get cooking. I work long hours, like 80, 85 hour weeks, and having something just ready to get cooking fast means no more staring blankly at the fridge wondering what to make for dinner. Click the link in the description or use my code and get 16 free meals plus free dessert for life while your subscription is active. 
So there we can see our city ready for paint, and I actually fell in love with the idea of hiding the trestle table so much that when I set up the board for the photo shoot, I grabbed some of my old Dawn of War Warhammer floor panels and built them into the other sides of the build, and uh, this idea, I'm running with it. It is awesome. So I think what I'm going to do in the future is make the kind of ruined city sector in the center completely walled in to the ground on all four sides. It's just so immersive. Oh, and also, if you'd like to see this board getting played on, like with models in the future, go and check out my second channel, Zorp Hammer, link down in the comments, as once we have fully finished this board, I'm definitely going to use it for a battle report. And while you're on there, feel free to check out the uh, Dawn of War Warhammer content over on Zorp Hammer as well. It's good fun. Finally, though, it is painting time. The road tiles first up got a big prime in Rust-Oleum Grey Primer, and then an accent pass, sort of from the side, kind of low down, to try and leave dark grey in the recesses, uh, while I hit that with a lighter grey. Then it is airbrush time. And first up is a blue grey for our roads. Now getting the right colour here, it, it was an important choice and it was a bit tricky, but once I got a kind of decent base tone uh, over all of the roads, I was really happy with the colour choice. I even did the uh, road tiles that are up behind the rampart in the upper city. Then I got every single one of our removable structures, both the intact and the ruined ones, and gave them the exact same prime. But this time, on our second part, with our light grey can, I did a traditional top-down zenithal to kind of build up the shadows underneath all our window sills and our roof lines and all the other horizontal details. While the blue-grey was still in the airbrush, I then used that to base coat all of our roofs on the spires, and I'm just so happy with that colour the more I see it. It's nice and desaturated, so it matches the kind of overall grim-dark vibe of the city, but it's really helping to break up the monotony of grey. Then it was time to slam down some black. And seriously, if you're using black, don't mess around with diluting black wargaming paints. Just get an ink or a high flow acrylic. In this case, I'm using Liquitex black ink. And this was just a huge layer across the whole board. First, every single window. And I'm not kidding, we are talking thousands of those windows needs to get base coated in black. And then all of the ruined buildings need a blast of thin black on all of the edges to kind of accent the burned and blasted ruin line. This was a mega monotonous task. A huge shout out to all of my patrons who I kept spamming with photos and chatting to in our Discord to kind of keep me company during the long painting hours on this project. You guys are the best. And uh, yeah, sorry for just absolutely murdering the chat with whip photos, um, but uh, it helped keep me motivated through all of these painting journeys. Then I guess gave our two large structures, the ruined elevator towers, the same prime as the little buildings, but I had to be careful not to melt the foam components with the rattle cans, and then I laid down all the road tiles together now that they'd fully dried, and did another pass of my blue just to kind of blend all of the edges and make it consistent so that if I moved all the tiles around, suddenly you didn't have a darker blue versus a light blue, and just get that road looking really nice and level across the whole board. I love watching all of the layers start to build up in a big terrain kind of painting process like this. So our airbrushing is finished. That is all of the black down on all the little windows and the big blue roads done as well. I haven't done the industrial stuff. No, it's not. Right, now uh, time to do the industrial details. <laughs> All of the little freestanding silos and tanks and pipes then got a prime and a big pass with black ink, and then I grabbed my old red contrast mix that some of you guys might remember from my Blood Ravens last year, and applied that to all the storage containers. And I just really fell in love with that red color again and how much it added to the overall palette of the city. So then I was like, where else can I use this red? And so I went back to my buildings and applied it to all of the large doors, which I'd already done a black prime on, and that red over the black on the doors was kind of dark and muted and moody, just suited the buildings really nicely. Airbrushing is actually finished now, and uh, it's time to activate the ultimate cheat mode. Yeah, so my whole life is basically a lie. I am never using gold and silver paint on small metal details ever again. Applying these colours with a metallic permanent marker is so easy and so much faster. Imagine if I'd tried to do all these windows with a brush. It'd be like a weak work. Uh, my uh, Jules 
from Word of Workshop was actually showing me this. It's an ultramarine. <laughs> uh, in his hobby toolkit recently, shout out to Jules, which kind of reminded me that scale modelers have been using these techniques for decades. I cannot believe it took me so long to give this a try. I used three colors, silver, gold, and then like a brass. And I kind of added details everywhere I could on the structures. It's just a really quick and easy way to add some real detail to these buildings. And then before we dive into the washers, I grabbed my spray gun and slapped down some gray primer on all of the large foam trench walls. The spray gun's amazing here because it puts down great coverage really quickly and it doesn't melt the foam. And then I can still do my top accent color with the rattle can. Then it's back to my Liquitex black ink and I'm just diluting this in water. That's it, no flow aids, no matte medium, just water to make my wash. And the reason for that is that this wash is gonna do some pretty interesting stuff for us. As I slap it down on these plastic road tiles, which have a lot of surfaces, the surface tension of the wash kind of folds in and around and, and it leaves strange patterns and dries with huge tide marks. And this is an amazing looking effect that added some much needed texture to the kind of flat plascrete portions of the road tiles. It looks like a, a combination of building up our grime, blast marks from explosions, and the old weathered marbling of the huge stone blocks assembled by the mason guilds. I helped it dry with the hairdryer, and if any particular tide mark didn't really look suitable, you can just kind of push it back by rubbing wet wash over it and then dabbing it away and drying it. And I just sort of built up layers and layers of these tide marks to create this texture. The only real downside to this technique is that the wash doesn't, by necessity, flow into the recesses because of that surface tension. So then I came back once this was all dry and accented the recess details with an oil pin wash. Speaking of oil washes, I then grabbed some thinner and my black oil and just began a huge wash across every single plastic building. At this point, I only had 10 hours till the photos were due for Warhammer Community. So I kind of just did a big all over slapdash wash to kind of build up the general definition and grime, which as you can see in this shot, unwashed versus washed, it's super effective. And I'll come back to this and I will apply some more kind of targeted washing when the entire board is done, I think to kind of get these completely delicious looking, but it's a wonderful outcome for now and really, really quick. Then I had to dress the ruins into the board while they were still wet. Uh, so I dried them off as best I could and then got them in place before adding the final detail, a heap of grimdark city rubble just sprinkled straight into the wet oils. Now that's certainly not ideal, but it will do nicely enough for our photo shoot. And as always, once you add the washers and the rubble to any board, it just gets a thousand times better. And just look at this. This beast, man. I am I'm so happy with how it got and, and the time that I had to get the board ready for the photo shoot. I think it looks really great considering those factors. I've got the article linked in the comments if you want to see how those photos turned out. And big thanks to Games Workshop, of course, for being so keen to feature this first part of the build on Warhammer Community. So I've had the weekend off and everything is, of course, now dry. And interestingly, those oils leaking off the buildings and mixing with the pigment from the base ready has created some really interesting effects but before we move anything and keep on building we need to seal that base ready in place. Isopropyl alcohol and scenic sealant which is basically watered down PVA and a bit of matte varnish went down all over the rubble with a pipette. The iso goes down first and then when the sealant drops into the rubble the alcohol breaks up the surface tension and helps it get into all of those layers and layers of rocks and rubble and aggregates. So it's been a big few months here on Zorba Zorb. I opened up about how the last year has been and you guys rallied around us so thank you so much from me and my family to everyone who joined the Patreon or here on YouTube super chatted or became a channel member or just subscribed and threw down a comment it's just amazing and we're super thankful for that and the last two videos have been okay we didn't actually lose money on them which was a nice change and I think a part of that is we kind of hashed out this new format in the comments about getting completionism right finishing these massive boards in nice, sustaining, fulfilling chunks. This will be the third Imperial Palace video in a row. Are you bored? I'm about to jump over to Minas Tirith and then back to the Middle Earth mega board. That's the next big thing. Should I jump there now? There's probably another three videos on this project in this block. Should I smash through those and then go back to Minas Tirith? I, I'm, I'm at a real loss. What do you want to see next? Do you want more Imperial Palace or do you want me to jump to Minas Tirith and Middle Earth for a couple of videos and then jump 
jump back to Imperial Palace. Please make the decision for me, because I don't know what to do. <laughs> Then it was time to begin work on the next section of the palace walls, a second monster gatehouse and battlement, which would be a mirror image of the first gate. I made two big pillars with some juicy slabs of XPS foam and glued them together, and then while they dried, I carved up the big central ramp with four angled wedges, and then textured that ramp with alfoil and brick. I then cut all the angled detail and chamfers into the front of the two pillars to create that nice kind of tapering form that works so well for the first gate, and then carved in a massive brick pattern. I then glued the two towers together with the ramp and an upper battlement, and then grabbed a bunch more foam to make our stretch of palace walls. And then after texturing that, I glued it to the gate on the opposite side to keep that mirror image of the first gatehouse. The final foam details are the trim around the gate, which will become the housing for the gate itself that we'll make soon, and then the upper toppers of our bastion. Once both of those upper ramparts were all finished, I gave the piece a big seal and crack fill with polyfiller, and then I glued these pieces down onto their baseboard, and just like the first trench section, I carved up some big sheets of generic brick texture and mounted them all together to follow the contours of the upper battlement and continue the form of the wall down into the trench, giving that illusion of massive scale. Then up behind the gate, I began to build the causeway and upper city. This is the exact same process as the first gatehouse with one key difference. First, I made the whole upper city area about six inches wider because I realized that I wouldn't have enough room to set out a big Dawn of War base for when we use this board for my Warhammer 40K Dawn of War campaign very soon over on my second channel, Zorpammer. And I also built this so that it matched up really nicely against the back of the first gatehouse, which is probably giving you guys a little sneak peek on one of the optional modular setups for this board, the double-sided super gate. I began mounting the upper city road tiles, but before fully committing, I need to kind of know how many I have to save for the bridges and the causeways across our next trench, and I want to do something really different with the next bridge to set it apart from the first one, so I decided to make the central bridge span from two T-junctions instead of straight pieces, and then take those T's out into little bastions that jut out to the sides, like the top of big buttresses, uh, which, you know, might even get little kind of mid-bridge gun emplacements. I then mounted that all up on a thick sheet of foam with some added details to extend those buttresses and then added trim along the edges and to make sure we don't have any more garish orange foam gave all of those parts a big prime with my spray gun. So this is the first of our modular setups. We've got the two gates. Obviously this one has a lot more to do on it but they're facing down over this ruined city no man's land in the middle. Very cool. In the very first video on this project we talked about how Building the entire Imperial Palace is impossible, but we could represent the whole palace with a super modular board that can lay out in heaps of different configurations. This is cool. Let's check out what else it can do. To prepare for maximum modularity, I pulled apart the city district and replaced the six foot long trestle table with a three foot square and then moved the new trench and gatehouse set up to the south. And here we've got an L-shaped fortification, like a double gated corner of any of the major battlements from the Imperial Palace. And once we add even more walls in up here and extra battlements, this one is gonna look fantastic. There are actually six variant layouts for this build that are totally different, and each of those layouts has a bunch of subtle variations. I'll take you through all of them when the next section is fully finished, but for now, here is the beginnings of one more. But nothing beats a big old straight section of massive castle walls. Now obviously, there's a lot left to do, not just the huge detailing of the upper battlements, but patching pieces, the whole trench continuing across, that second causeway and lower city, there's a lot here, but the crazy thing is that these three modular setups we just looked at aren't even the most impressive that this board can do. We are getting so close to the end of this Imperial Palace journey and I can't wait to see you in the next one.